So, all right, let's get this. I am not together, and now I am. All right, so, uh, you were reading the question. What did the question say? You buy and go on vacay. So tell me, so it'll be okay. All right, so there we go. Now, here's what we're going to talk about. Now, we're in a series right now. We're in a series called The Devil Wears. If you've got amazing vision, you can see that little tiny phrase that says, Unmasking Temptation. Now, what we've been looking at in this new year is unmasking the lies that the enemy puts over God's truth. Sometimes he puts these masks over us to make it hard for us to see God and to find his way. And I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. Look, I know it's a new year, but it's going to be the same you if you keep following for the same old place. Same old tricks, same old lies. And so today we've been talking about this whole series is unmasking the lies of the enemy so that we can enjoy life. So I don't know about you, but I know my heart for you is for you to find life. My heart for you is God's heart for you. Do you know it's okay to be happy? And God wants us to enjoy life, but there's a way to do it. There's a way to enjoy life, and we're going to look at some instances. And we're going to pull back the lies, expose the lies so we can enjoy life. And here's the lie that we're going to talk about today. Ready? Here's the lie that the enemy does regarding money that keeps us from truly enjoying life. And here's the lie. Hey, enjoy yourself. Have you ever said that to yourself? Had somebody tell you that? Hey, treat yourself to something special. Treat yourself. It's okay. Enjoy yourself. You deserve it. You worked hard. You earned it. Have you had, Have you ever told yourself that? Have you ever said, you know what? I deserve that new purse. I deserve that new purse. You know, I, I, I deserve, you know, I deserve to go out to eat and, you know, get a nice big old steak today. You know, I worked hard. You know, I, I deserve this. I deserve that new car. Did you just buy that one last year? No, yeah, I deserve a new one. Okay, right? Did you, you ever had that? You ever, like, talked yourself into a vibe? Right? We do that. We do that. Now, I want you to know that there is a truth in there. Can you enjoy yourself? Meaning, can you, and I'm talking to believers and Christians, any of them in no. Can you buy things? Can a Christian, in this case, buy nice things? Can a Christian go on vacation? Can a Christian have a nice car, a nice house? Okay? There's an Instagram page, if you haven't heard it, it's called Preachers in Sneakers. All right? This got big last year. This Instagram page on Preachers and Sneakers literally goes off and finds what preachers out there and finds the tennis shoes that they're wearing and posts it online. I'm like, yo, this dude's wearing sneakers that are worth three grand. This guy's wearing sneakers that are worth two Gs. This guy's wearing sneakers that are $900. And that's like the thing. Whatever. Could a pastor, could a preacher have a nice pair of shoes? Okay? And look, mine. Walmart. Okay, just because. But just because I'm trying to be all, I ain't trying to be all, look, I'm going to be holier than now. I'm going on the, it was Walmart. I, I just saw it, I get it, I need to, whatever, so that's what it is. Now, but could you as a, as a Christian, as a believer, because here's the thing, we live in a culture, we love to live in a culture of 80 comparisons, but we love to live in a culture that says, he deserves that, or he doesn't deserve that. Oh, that person makes that much money? <laughs> We're kind of, we live in, do we not do that? Have we not had that complaint? So as believers, where's the line? Where is the line? Can I buy stuff? Can I enjoy things? Can I take my family on a nice vacation? Can I have financial goals? Can I do these things? And where is the line that I don't cross? Because see, the truth is, this is why there's a lie. Look, the enemy always starts the lie by just twisting a little bit of the truth. Because here's the truth. You can enjoy yourself. Here's the lie. Enjoy yourself. I'm saying. I know. That's why it's so subtle. That's why it's so subtle because it's the same thing, but it's the intention. It's deep down in the heart. Okay, deep down in the heart. In fact, let me show you this little model. Can we put the, the thing back to back? Here is, here's the, the thing where God, all right, this is where God is a formula to life. You want to enjoy life? Here's the way to do it. This is the priority. Okay, learn to love God, serve others, use stuff. Okay, use stuff. This is the order. If you want to know if you can do things and what can I have, what can I not have, can I get that PS5 when it comes out, all those other things right here it is. Can, if you got to learn to love God, serve others, use stuff. Our tendency, your tendency, listen, mine too, I ain't, I ain't trying to be better than you. Our tendency is to do what's on the right. Our tendency is to love stuff, serve ourselves, and use people. Tell me I'm lying. Just did, then you're either lying to yourself.
yourself, or you're confused, and we'll pray for you later, all right? That's our default. That's our default. Our default setting is love stuff, serve yourself, and use people for your, for your benefit, for your, listen, that you might find a form of happiness from time to time doing the thing on the right, but it's not lasting, and it cannot compare when you do things in the proper order. Yes, you can have stuff. Yes, you can enjoy your life. Yes, you can buy that thing to go on vacay. But again, where is it? Where is it on your priority list? Because here's the thing. If you cannot see past the enemy's lies regarding money, you're going to either end up one or both. Ready? Broke or broken. One of the two. So look, we're going to dive in on Jesus. You guys know that one of the top topics that Jesus talked about the most was hell, number one, and our love of money. He talked a lot about that because it was one of the biggest things that can stand between us and God. So we're going to look at Jesus' words. We're going to dive right in. We're going to look at Luke, a section in Luke, and we're going to look at a similar conversation that Jesus had with somebody else in the Gospel of Matthew. And so first, let's dive in on Luke. I want you to check this out. I'm going to read here Luke chapter... 12, we're going to read 13 through, all the way through 34. And I want y'all to check this out. Here Jesus is having a, a conversation. He's teaching some people. Some dude rolls up. And we're going to look at verse 13. It says, someone from the crowd, someone that God, Jesus was talking to, someone from the crowd said, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Teach, hey, tell my brother he needs to share. All right, who got siblings in the house? All right, y'all ever fought? Hey. Tell him, tell me. Did they ever come up like, hey, dad, tell him, tell him to share, tell him to give that, tell him, right? You ever do one of those, right? Right? We've done that. If you've had a sibling or whatever, it's like, mom, mom, you see your cereal, it's like, oh, whatever, right? We, we have one of those, right, for us in our house because we don't have, we have too many people, not enough TVs. So the thing that constantly is the fight of uh, sharing is the remote. Can I pick? Can I, can I pick today? Like, man, no one's picking. I was like, I'm just over it. I was like, ah, like, can I pick? I want to pick a show. Can I pick? Anyways. So here's this guy going to Jesus. Jesus, tell my brother to share, to divide his inheritance with me. This is the problem. This guy comes with a problem, but look what Jesus says. My friend. Bro, I love Jesus. Look at that. He, he comes straight out. He's like, guy, hold on. All right? Use that. Addresses him as friend. Addresses him as friend because he's about to hit him hard. <laughs> he's about to hit him real good. He's setting him up. I'm like, buddy, I love you. Get ready. This one's going to be big, and I love you. So I love his opener, man. He says, friend, who appointed me to be a judge or arbiter over you? First off, Jesus was a rabbi, and during this culture, during this time, it was very typical for someone to do what he just did. You go to rabbis to say, hey, rabbi, I need you to help, him, help me figure out this legal dispute. And rabbis could jump in on a legal dispute issue. And so that's what this guy was doing to Jesus. But Jesus is saying, where are bro? Hold on now. It's like, who am I to do that? Well, then he says, then he tells him this. He got more to the more important thing. He says, watch out. Hey, guy, hey, God, friend, buddy. Look, I need you to watch out. Look what he said. Watch out for what? Watch out and be on guard against all, what was that word? Greed. It's a nasty word. Watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of possessions. Jesus says, listen, your life is not defined by your stuff. Your life and your worth is not defined by your house compared to someone else's house. Your life and worth is not defined by how much money you have versus someone else. Y'all feel with me on that? Okay, because a lot of times we're like, oh, I don't have enough, so that means I am not enough. It's a lot. But Jesus says, watch out for greed. Because this guy, this guy had a problem. But it sounds like a justice problem, right? It's not fair. He's not sharing with his inheritance. By the way, in this Jewish culture, the firstborn got a double portion of the inheritance. So let's say we got three. You got three brothers, right? You got three brothers. The entire inheritance would be divided up into four. You got three brothers, but every inheritance would be divided by four. And then the eldest got a double portion. That's just how in the Jewish culture is what they did. Now, so this guy, I, I tried to study. I tried to find this answer. I cannot be certain. I'm almost confident. So I'm making an assumption here, okay? I believe that this guy is one of the younger brothers. And I believe that he is talking about the eldest who received the double portion. And he's saying, tell the eldest to share. If he has twice as more, that's not fair. I want more. I don't think it's just because he was born first, all right? I mean, he get twice as much, okay? That, I, so this guy says, I have a fairness problem. Jesus, Jesus says, no, no, no. You don't got a justice problem, my guy. Friend, you have a greed problem. 
you have a covetous problem. Coveting. Anybody heard of that? Ten, one of those Ten Commandments? In fact, it's the last one. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's blank, 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 blank. Now, some of us, we don't know what the word covet means, so I'm just going to break it down. Coveting, and that's a word we're going to use in English. Do you know what coveting means? All right, coveting means that you want something so bad. It's a combination of worry, greed, and jealousy. It's a cocktail of all those three things. It's a cocktail of greed, jealousy, and worry. Because what coveting is, it's this strong hunger and desire for more, yet the more you have of what you want, you're never satisfied. And it's not just like, wow, that guy, that guy has a nice house. I want a nice house too. No, it's, I want that house, I deserve that house, and you aren't happy that he has that house and you don't. You catch me on coveting now? <laughs> Tell me you haven't felt like that in a long time. Say, wait, that person got the promotion? Yo, that person got the promotion? This person, they got pregnant? And I just, he, and I've been working so, that guy got that house. And that, <laughs> you know some people that, man, just be happy for me, bro, right? You know some people, it's hard to be happy for some people sometimes. Part of that is because of our coveted nature. It's like, I don't like the fact that he has it and I don't. I want it. But the sad part about this greed is that no matter how much you have, the hunger gets, grows worse. And it's never enough. So then Jesus tells this parable. So let's read. Jesus tells these parables to try to get people to imagine and to really see a different perspective. So let me just read the whole thing. He then tells the guy a parable, a story, a fake story. A rich man, a rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, so he's talking to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store all of my crops? I got more than I can handle, man. I got too much. I got, I got, you know, uh, four, car, four cars and I got a two-car garage. I'm like, okay. Ah, I'll do this, he says. I'll tear down my barns and build a bigger one. Store all of my grains and my goods there. And then I'm going to say to myself, this guy, uh, we, we all have conversations, right? We all talk to ourselves, right? I'm like, you hungry? And I was like, you ever do that? I was like, man, I'm tired. I'm going to go right cheese. Like, well, we all have that conversation and we always talk to ourselves. We do that. So this guy is talking to himself. And then, you know what I'm going to tell myself? You have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink. And what is that last phrase? Enjoy, Enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. You deserve that. Enjoy yourself. I know, man. I worked hard for that. Enjoy yourself. You like the code. All right? Enjoy yourself. He tells this parable, but then look. By the way, I don't know if you caught how many of the personal pronouns that guy used. My, 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 my. Me, I, a lot of those. Now look what he says. Jesus says, but God says to this person, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. And the things that you prepared, whose will they be? He's trying to get him to see, look, you can accumulate everything. But God, understand you can spend your whole life getting more, 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 more. But when you die, you can't take any of it, any of it with you. So what, and again, notice the fool word. I know at first he said my friend, but he really wanted, to, the guy's being a fool. The guy's being a fool. He doesn't understand all of you care so much about something that could be gone like that. It's gone. Work so hard. And whose then will it be? Because it won't be yours. That Jesus says that is how it will be for the one who stores up treasures for food. And is not rich towards God. Guys, do you know there's a way that you can be rich towards God and it has nothing to do with money? Being rich towards God is having all of him. You, I can tell you how to be rich towards God. Jesus taught us. Love God and love others. You know what it is. You know when you give or when you do something for somebody that it just makes a difference. It fills you up. You know, to be rich towards God is to love others the way Jesus loves you. To walk humbly, to love mercy, to do justice, to do the right thing. That's what it means to be rich towards God. It's to love others as he loved us. But he said, if you store up treasures for yourself, it's not enough. It will never be enough, and it's a waste of your life. It's a waste of your life. And so here, see, he's talking now. I know we're kind of talking about rich people here. But I, you've got to understand that rich and the poor, we both, both, rich and poor together, can fall under the spirit of coveting. 
Because tell me, tell me online where you know some, some people, some broke people, you know some broke people who do not need, okay, who do not need earbuds, air, air okay? You got some broke people, okay? I know it. All right, you got broke people who, who got earbuds on, but they got an EBT, you know, an EBT card, whatever. I'm like, my gosh, bro, if you can't buy food, you don't need to be buying earbuds. I'm sorry, I just insulted somebody, but I'm, you know, I'm saying, am I, am I yes or no? You know, like, like, bro, like, you, you are constantly, you are in debt. You don't need Netflix. I know it's 13. You don't need all that stuff. You don't need this. You don't need that. But you got it because you feel like you need to have it. You know, listen. The rich and poor, we can constantly be fall under coveting, wanting because everybody else has it, or wanting because of the status that it gives you. But in the end, in the end, what? Now, here's what coveting does. Coveting can lead you to extreme greed and extreme, um, sort of extreme greed, extreme jealousy. But do you know what coveting can also lead to? Extreme worry. Gee, look at Jesus. He keeps on going, and he ain't done yet with this guy. He pick him back up. He ain't ready. He, you know, get him out. He needs some more. And for this is for everyone else in the crowd. So let's keep reading. Look at verse 22. Then he turns to his disciples now, and he's talking to them, and he's talking to still everybody in earshot. So listen, therefore, again, the therefore is connecting everything that he said before, all right? Every, if you ever read therefore, it's correcting everything, connecting everything that he just said before, that statement. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you eat, or what, or about your body, what you'll wear. For life is more than food and body more than clothing. You probably have, your life is more than just stuff. Your life is more than stuff. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. And they don't have storehouses or barns, yet God feeds them. Guys, this is a great question you need to ask yourself. Are you worth more than a bird? Am I worth more than a bird? It's a, it's a rhetorical question because Jesus is, yes, you are. You are worth more than the birds, and look what God does for them. He keeps on going. Can any of you? Add one moment to his lifespan by worrying. If then you are not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Pastor Tony Evans says worrying is like a rocking chair. It's a lot of effort, but you end up going nowhere. I love that. I love that. That's worry. That's worry. You're just spinning your wheels. You're just constantly feeling and doing, yet you go nowhere. Wasted energy. He keeps on going. Consider how the wild, look, he's not done. Well, think about flowers. Consider how the wildflowers grow. Plants grow, but they don't labor. They don't spin thread. They don't do all these things. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these little flowers. And if that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you? Oh, you of little faith. You of little faith. Don't strive for what you should eat and drink. And don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things. And your father knows you need them. Look, your daddy knows. Your dad knows you need food. Your dad knows you got to pay the bills. Your dad knows all these things which you need. He knows you. He got you. Why worry about all these things? But instead, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, if I'm not seeking the kingdom first, you know whose kingdom you're seeking? Your own. If you're not seeking God's kingdom, you're seeking yours. Or, even more sadder, you can get caught up seeking, you, you can get caught up building somebody else's kingdom for them. And just they just rope you in it, you rope you into it. But it says, seek first the kingdom, and then all of these things will be provided. Again, the order, remember I told you? Love God, serve others, you stuff. If you put God in the right spot, He will take care of you. He does. He promises that. Amen. Promises. If you do this, then you're gonna, it's not that you can't have anything, no. But this is the way to avoid being trapped into coveting. Look, he keeps on going. Don't be afraid. Again, little flocks, my sheep, don't be afraid. Because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Seek the kingdom. He wants to give it to you. He wants to, so you experience all that he has and all that you can have in him. He wants to give it to you. So seek it, desire it, ask for it. And then he says, sell your possessions, give to the poor, make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. And inexhaustible treasures in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, is Jesus saying, uh, I gotta tell you now, I gotta sell all my stuff and give it away? No, no, but notice, what's the purpose of using stuff now? To serve others. You guys use that? See, you, when you love God and serve others, you use, you use stuff to serve others. Y'all catch that? You use your stuff to serve others. 
So here, he's not saying you gotta be broke because then you broke. Okay. And so somebody gotta help you then. And so the idea is that hey, listen, use your stuff to serve others. The guy in the parable wanted to use everything for what? To serve himself. To serve himself. It was different. No, serve others. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look, you know what Jesus is trying to process even there? A lot of times we, we get that pulled back up. You know, it's like, listen, if you treasure money, what Jesus is saying, if you treasure money, that's where your heart will be, right? Yeah. If you treasure money, your heart's going to be full of worry. If you treasure money, if you value your stuff, if you treasure money, your heart will be full of worry. You know where the worry comes from? The worry is either going to be, how can I get more? The worry is either going to be, how, what if I lose it? How can I keep from losing it? Okay? That's the worry. The worry is, oh, I, I bought that, I had that, oh, no, it's not enough. Or then the worry can be, you so broke now because you tried to, you know, be rich, you ended up ending up broke, and now you worry. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of debt? How am I going to, you see that? And that's not God, what God wants for you. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If you treasure your stuff, if you treasure money, you're going to be a slave to those things. Now, Jesus had a different, I mean, now we're going to pull back, we're going to get a different conversation, Amy compare, right? Let's look at Matthew. Here, this is a different conversation he, Jesus is having, but he's using similar things, okay? So here, let's look at Matthew 6, chapter 19, no, chapter, yeah, chapter 6, let's start 19, right? Check it out, 6, 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There he says it again. Listen, do you know the one thing? There is something that you can't take with you when you go to heaven. When you die, there is one thing you take with you. You ready? You know what it is? You take your legacy. That's it. You take your legacy with you. So if you use stuff... If you buy, if you love stuff and you use others to serve yourself, then all of that effort stays. You can't take that with you. But when you love God, serve others, and use stuff to serve others, use stuff to lead others to Christ, use, uh, you know, use your stuff to make a difference, do you know what you can take with you? Your legacy. Every life changed for the gospel. Amen. That you're going to take with you. That you can take with you. That's an investment that you're going to cash in on on the other side of heaven. Yeah. That's an investment. Your that's an investment. Your legacy. What you did with your stuff. Because none of your stuff is coming with you. But what you did with your stuff, that's gonna follow. Mm -hmm. That's gonna go. And so here you can say, okay, well, hold on, Pastor, but, but, but what about I gotta take care of me first, though, right? If, if I'm not taking care of me first, how am I gonna be in a position to take care of somebody else? You're right. True. That means you gotta do certain things in order, but I, I, I was listening to that question and I know th there's two people that could ask me that. If someone said, look, I can't be generous, I can't use my stuff to serve others, because first off, if I try to use my stuff to serve others now, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to pay my bills. If I try, if you're asking me to be more generous, then I can barely pay my bills as is. So you're probably one of two people if you have that excuse. Someone said, well, I can't be generous, I gotta put me first. Well, you either, Lack faith in God. Because didn't Jesus say, oh, you, you guys have little faith? Do you know why he's saying that? Because he said, you're afraid. If you don't, if you're not willing to put God first, it's because you don't trust God. And if you don't trust God, it's because you don't know him yet. If you don't trust him, because he is trustworthy. If you are not, if you're not giving and you're not being generous, it's because you don't know him. Because if you knew him, you would want to. Not because of, oh, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to look, you know, look bad in front of the big guy. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's not like that at all. Because God wants something for you, not so much from you. Because when you put money in the right priority, it is better for you. It's better for you. And so if you're one of those, like, nah, I don't know, man, I got to put me first because I can't. You know, if I start doing that, I'm not going to have enough to pay bills. So either, number one, either... You don't know God, so you don't trust him because you don't know him yet. Or, I'm just sorry, or you just, you're a bad steward. You don't know how to handle money. Okay, because I guarantee you, like, oh, I don't got money to be generous. I'm like, that new jacket. <laughs> how many of those you got already? Yeah. <laughs> right? This one, you, you, you guys catch me? And so, yes, you, it is right. 
The only way you can be generous and to do more with your stuff is you got to rein in your stuff, right? You got to rein in your spending. You got to be in a budget. You got to do all these stuff and be under control. Look, look, look Jesus keeps on talking. I, I, I want to let him talk. Look what he says here. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Verse 22. The eye is, this is all connected, by the way, because this, this next section sounds random, but he's giving you a visual of treasuring, your, of, of putting your heavenly treasures. The eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is dark, how deep is that darkness? I know that sounds disconnected, but it's not. Look, talking about 2020 vision, right? We're talking about 2020, 2020 vision. He's talking about having 2020 vision there with light. How can you have eyes full of light when you see? The only way that you can see things clearly is when you do things God's way. When you trust in God and you put your confidence in God. God will, when He'll give you light inside, and then with those eyes, you'll be able to see light. You'll be able to see through the enemy's lies. You'll be able to see through all of those things. But if you don't seek the kingdom first, if you don't put your faith and confidence, it's like you're walking around with your eyes closed. You're blind, you're in darkness. And eventually, if I walk around with my eyes closed long enough, I'm going to bump into something, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt myself. And there's a lot of us out there walking around with no little light in our eyes. And we keep on making financial mistake after financial mistake because we're walking in the dark, we don't realize what we're doing because stuff has a hold of our heart, not our Savior. Stuff has a hold of your heart. Jesus ends his last verse here, right? Put it up. Great one, man. Jesus is going to drop the, the biggest bomb of all right here in this statement. Verse 24. No one. How many people? <laughs> Special people. There might be a few. There's a could be an exception. No one. So don't make an exception for you, man. Oh, that's not me. No one. Okay? No one. No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. First off, here's how can you serve money? How can you serve God? And what's this whole thing about serve? You know what the word serve means that Jesus is using? The word serve means to be commanded by. Meaning this person, when he says jump, you jump. With it, automatically. So you mean to be controlled by. You cannot say... I am controlled by God. I am God is my God, and money is my God the same. You can't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot live by this and not the other. It is one or the other. And one will lead you to despise the other. One will lead you to despise the other. So to serve is to be in the command of. Do you know how, how do you serve money, guys? How do you serve money? You know how you serve money? If your impulses, if, if in your mind it says, Spend these ten dollars, yes sir. <laughs> right, that's what it is. That's what you do. Say, hey, why don't you go out to eat? You can make a sandwich at your home. Come on, out to eat. <laughs> right? Okay, yes ma'am. You know, boom. That, that, that's you. When you get that desire, when in your heart wells up, I want to buy it. And Amazon click. Oh, well, now it's horrible. Amazon is just one swipe. Golly, it gets you. Oh my gosh, I've been a victim of that one, right? Oh no, oh, I did it. No. Oh, okay. There's another box at the door. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's, I know it, but that's what it means. To serve money is when it, when there's something in you that says, buy it. You went, okay. Buy it. I don't have the money. Credit card. Okay. That's what it means to be enslaved to stuff. That you want to, but you just keep on. You keep on. You keep on. That's what it means to be a slave to stuff. How else do you serve money? Do you know how you else you serve money? Here we go. If that one didn't smack you, get ready. Here comes the right hook. Okay? <laughs> that was just a jab. Okay? Here's the hook. How do you serve money versus serving God? You know what else it means to serve money? It means to enjoy the benefits of it. Do you enjoy the benefits? Because money's money, right? You don't bow down to money. How do you serve it? By buying something and then enjoying the benefits of what you just bought. Do you enjoy your Savior as much as you enjoy your stuff? That's that one. Told you it was coming. Okay? Okay? All right. Told you it was coming. That's the last one there. I got my eye. Yo, I, I can be guilty of this too. I got to check myself. 
Because do you get more validation from your stuff? I feel more special because I bought that, because I have that, versus knowing I'm a child of God. Then you gotta reprioritize your heart. You love your stuff too much more. And if it has your heart, again, you treasure your heart. If you, I'm sorry, if you treasure your money, it's gonna be full of worry. But when you treasure Christ, you're free. Amen. When you treasure Christ, your heart is in Christ. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If you value Christ, if you value Christ in that way, if you value Christ, then your heart's going to be there. And if Christ has your heart, he's going to protect you. He's going he's to fill you. He's going to fill you. But you can't do both, guys. Listen, you can't do both. So can you earn money? Can you earn money? Can you go on a nice vacation and still be honoring to God? Listen, yes. If all of your stuff leads you to thank God, to say, Lord, I'm going to go on that vacation, and you spend time on that vacation thanking God for what he has done in your life. And, and by the way, you're not overdoing it. Like, you know, what's our budget? You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know like, uh, no, you honor God by doing things according, you know, living beneath your means, and you're honoring him in that way. You're still generous. If you can go on vacation and you're still being generous, then there you go. If you want to buy that jacket and buy that thing, but you, you, you keep your, you know, stuff on lock and you're saving money and stuff, then you can get it. It's okay. As long as you're saying, Lord, this is not my car, this is yours. Amen. This is not my stuff, this is yours. Mm-hmm. Because what if God says, hey, you just bought that. Great. I want you to give it to that person over there. What? <laughs> I rebuke it. Jesus, man, <laughs> devil. You behind me and say, Can you go on vacation? Yeah. Can you buy stuff? Yes. 
But is God, are you using it for yourself? Can you no more afford it? Do you have all this stuff in the right spot? Why? What's your motivation? But again, I want to ask you, do you have stuff or does stuff have you? If stuff has you, it's never going to be enough. Only Jesus is enough. So I'm going to, before I wrap up, I'm going to play one song as a reflexive song. But before that, I got one. I'm going to give you an even bigger application question. So here's the, here's the thing. Can we put the, the tithing challenge up? I'm going to do something with you. And, I'm gonna, and this is something you can go online to our website, tabernaculogod.church. And there is on one of the cards, you keep on sliding, there's a tithing challenge. I want y'all to, if you have not gotten your money together, if you, if money, if God, if you can say, yes, I spend way too much than I need to. God, I need God to be Lord of my money, not just also Lord of my life, because that's what it means. Then I'm going to challenge you over the next three months, over the next nine days. To say, all right, I want to prioritize God in the right way. I want to put you know, everything. And so here's what this 90-day tithing challenge is. A tithe is something that we believe in and we act on. Me and my wife, we do. Right there, when I, a minute ago, I gave offering in front of all of you. It was my tithe. It was my tithe. A tithe means 10%. And for us, the, the best, I guarantee you, you live in this formula. If you're going to go, here it comes, Pastor. I'm going to look. If you live with this formula, I guarantee you'll be happy. Take 10% of your money, give it away. Take 10%, save it. Just better manage the other 80. Guarantee you're going to be home. so much happier if you do that. But what I'm going to challenge you is if an even greater level happens. Because when God said, when you tithe 10%, meaning straight off, here's whatever I make, 10%, boom, it goes to funding the mission so that other people can be rescued and their souls saved and families Amen. restored, the nation transformed. Look, I'm not telling you to tithe to this church just so we can have a bigger building. Man, forget that. I was like, you know, I, I want, let's fund the mission to rescue souls. That's what that is. I mean, very little. I want to say less than, 50, less than 50% of the money that we collect goes into building and salary and stuff. It, the other stuff just goes into funding things to transform lives. That's what that does. And so when I'm asking you to tie, that's what I'm doing. And, and so what is it? Let me just put it up. What is it? It's giving 10%. How do you do it? Well, here's what, how I do it. Because if you get, you know, get paid gross and net, here's what me and my wife do. Because we get all of our taxes taken out, a big one, so hopefully that, you know, we can have a return at the end. So I give 10% of what I get paid on every single week. Every month, I get paid three times in a month. I give a 10% easy off the top. And then when I get my tax return, 10% off that too. Because that's money that I didn't tie on. That's what we do. And so as a, as a family, years, and we've seen God follow through each and every time as being what we faith. And now, why should you do it? That's the three reasons why. Because this is, by the way, God's word, and this is pre-law. So anybody here, you're like, oh, you know, Pastor, what a great thing. Like, Man, this was before Moses. So just check it. Here's why you need to do it. Here's why I'm telling you. Guys, you're going to enjoy a level of happiness and joy when you put money in the spot. And this is where you do it. So number one, if you tithe, if you do that, you rebuke the devourer. That's a promise from God. The devourer is this crazy word. What it means devour? Well, Think about it. How much of your peace is being devoured by worry? How much of your joy is being devoured by grief? How much of your life and happiness is being devoured by fear? Because money is not enough, and you're like, oh, but I gotta, and I, I gotta be looking like everybody else and this. No, your you you your soul is devoured when your money is not in the right spot. But not only that, if you live by impulse then your money is devoured. You never have enough. You never have enough. This is it. You open up your life and your money to be cursed by the enemy. If you hold it in your hands, it's cursed. But when you tithe, you're just saying, God, well, first off, God's only saying, look, you can keep the other 90. I think that's fair. Okay, God's saying he just wants 10. You keep the 90. But when it, listen, it is better and it is better, it's blessed. It is better to live with 90% of your money blessed than 100%. Guys. So when you tithe, you rebuke the devourer. Every time you tithe, it reminds you to be grateful. Like every time when you tithe, it's a big one. Like, ah, I don't but every time I tithe, I say, Lord, I, I'm tithing because I'm grateful that I got paid. That I got money. That I have a job. And that job comes from you. My ability to process, to be smart, to work hard, my health. God, it comes from you. So every time I tithe, it's an opportunity to be grateful to God. It rebukes the devourer and it repositions your priorities. Because here's the priorities. Can we put that one up again? Here's the priorities again. When you learn to love God, serve others, and use stuff, you're going to tap into the level of joy you can't find anywhere else. 
But if you don't, then you're gonna love stuff. The, oh God, you know, any reason why you would not want to do this tithing challenge? So I'm, 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 I love y'all, so I gotta say it to your faces. It's because you either love stuff too much, or you don't realize how much God loves you. And you want to serve yourself, you're looking out for number one, and you're using. It's, it's, I'm telling you guys, it's not enough. It's not worth it. Because no amount of stuff is enough. And I want to show, I want to, we're gonna end with this, so I'm gonna need some help. Alright? Going a little long today, but it's okay. I need some help. Mike, go real quick. Alright, so check it out, guys. Here is why. Here's what happens when you get. Alright. Here's what happens when you get. So. Okay. So here's what you do when you reprioritize your stuff. You ready? Follow along. So let's say this is your life. This is everything. Alright? This is, we got sand, we got cereal, and we got soap. All different stuff. Sand, cereal, and soap. Here's what happens when you tithe, and here's what happens when you prioritize God in the right way. Let's pretend soap, this is the big, solid thing. This is the most important stuff in your life. This is the things that you care about, you value, really important. Uh, the cereal represents important things, but it's, you know, it, it's important, but not as important. Sand is just all the other stuff in life. This is good time management and money management right here, ready? Follow along. So, if you do not have, a, if you try to serve money rather than God, I told you, stuff is never enough, right? Here's what happens. If you can't budget your time or your money, your life is just going to be full of just a bunch of just nonsense. A bunch of things that's just fluff that's not that important. And then you're going to try to, you know, put all the other things that are important too, but then you realize that, notice, look at this. It's, there's not enough space. It's okay, baby. There's not enough space. There's not enough space here for what matters. Do you see that? It's not enough. It's not enough. If you can't rein in your money, if you can't rein in your stuff, it's not enough. But when you put things in the proper order, meaning you put God first, and you put you prioritize your family, you prioritize the word of God, you put him first in your life, the solid pieces, well then... Okay? You put the other non you know, as important things as well. By the way, this is, you can tell this is all equally measured. Okay? Is it is it is this full? Does it look full? Alright? Then what about the others? Guys, which one? Which one do you want for your life? Which one do you want? You see that? Same equal amount of stuff. Equal opportunity on both. This, it couldn't fit everything. But why did this fit? It's the same bars of soap, same size, same equal. How come it fit here, not here? Because you put first things first. Listen, when you put first things first, when you seek the kingdom of God, what did he say? All of these things will be added unto you. Amen.
takes care of you. I'm telling you guys. And so I'm going to be the same way as my friends. 